I think a lot of people these days talk about YOLO and, you know, you don't need money to be happy and all that sort of stuff. And for me, I had my, my mum very early. She, she had breast cancer um, and we almost lost everything over that, right? And it was the thing that saved us was my dad had uh, a property to sell to come up with the money to be able to fund because the funding for the chemotherapy and the radiation and the surgeries and all the time off. And I think when you go through something traumatic, you never forget it. And that became my why. It was like, money is so important, right? People don't think about money being important. Well, you haven't had a loved one where money solves a problem, yeah. right? And sometimes, and it's and it's the thing is, it's not about the money, it's the problem that it solves. Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week, I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders, and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom, and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Will you ever be rich? And what does being rich even mean? And what's investing really about? Is it just about money and acquiring more stuff? Or is there more to it? Unfortunately, it's a sad fact that many hardworking Aussies are likely to wind up in exactly the same financial position they actually started off in, following in the footprints of their parents and grandparents generationally. And while it's far easier now for most Aussies to shift from the old traditional concept of working class to middle class, it can still be very difficult to make the leap from there to becoming truly wealthy. And being wealthy is being very different from being rich. So let me explain. By global standards, the great majority of Australians are rich. We enjoy a great standard of living and have the incomes to fund them. But if your job or your business ended today, how long could you afford to keep funding your current lifestyle? For most, it's days and weeks. For some, it stretches out to months. And for a very few, it would last a year or more. The main reason for this is that most Aussies spend their lives trading their time for money, either as an employee or running their own hand-to-mouth small business, which leaves precious few hours in the day, let alone brain power, to learn about investing in the future and associated strategies, or actually taking educated and insightful actions towards achieving real wealth. In addition, many never save enough money to take the first step and invest in a massive at all. Or they secure the wrong type of asset to start off with, which then prevents them from ever reaching a point where they can leverage it and really make money work for them rather than them work for money. And even those that do may struggle to do much more because they just don't have the mindset or the know-how to take things further. And they limit their own potential by playing not to lose rather than playing to win, letting fear override their fortune. And this is what separates those that may be income rich short term, but never achieve wealth. Because true wealth is about time, the freedom of time and choice, about being in a position where you have the freedom of time to do what you want, when you want, where you went, who you want, because your lifestyle and income needs are being met without requiring much of your time to generate it. So today's guest and I are on a mutual mission to help you become time billionaires, a concept that I first heard about from Sahil Bloom's blog about Graham Duncan's episode of the, Terrace, the Tim Ferriss show. And the key point here is that time is our most precious and limited asset. Let me illustrate. A million seconds is 11 days. A billion seconds is just over 31 years. By the age of 50, most of us only have about a billion seconds left. So most of us start life as multi-time billionaires but we squander most of it worrying and working for someone else. And most of us fail to realise the true value of time until most of it's already gone. So where are you investing yours? And how do you become a wealthy time billionaire where you enjoy the freedom of time to choose your own adventure each and every day? In simple terms, it's just about embracing time as your biggest friend instead of treating it as your biggest enemy. By making the time now to invest your time, knowledge, energy and money to leverage the time you've got in order to exponentially grow your wealth-creating assets over time so that time is working for you while you're enjoying the journey, all in order to get your free time back. 
Now, it all sounds simple when you say it like this, but and in fact, it is actually simple, but it's not easy to achieve because you need to embrace the courage to swim against the common worker versus well-builder tide and then have the patience, persistence and resilience to take that road less travelled and last the distance to achieve time freedom and become a true time billionaire on your terms. So how do you make the shift from being a work income independent and short term income rich to becoming long term time wealthy? A great place to start is to follow and emulate the example of others. And in this regard, today's special guest, Daniel Walsh, is a leading, breathing testimony to the wealth builder, time billionaire approach. And as you're about to hear, He successfully transitioned from being a tradie at the age of 19, earning the princely sum of just $34,000 a year, to becoming a train driver while investing and leveraging exponentially to build the money momentum required to create a very impressive property portfolio that's now worth uh, somewhere in the excess of $20 million. And and I think you're still in your 30s, Daniel, uh, which has then enabled Daniel and his wife to found his award-winning buyer's agency, Your Property, Your Wealth to help you and other hard-working Aussies to secure your financial freedom. So today he's going to share the nitty-gritties of his own personal journey and how he did it, before revealing his secret, his success secrets from his new book, Six Principles to Retire Younger and Richer, in next week's episode. Now, I'm really looking forward to diving into all of this, so welcome and let's get invested, Daniel. Thanks for having me, mate. It's, uh, what an intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we both, uh, the inspirations come from your book. Uh, you know, I, I uh, always read uh, anyone who comes on the show and has taken the the very lengthy time to pen a book and, and all of the uh, distillation that goes with that. Uh, I wouldn't be paying you much respect if I didn't read it. And uh, it always inspires me in terms of the sorts of things that you and I want to be communicating to people that uh, we know we can help. So, uh, look, um, uh, you're known to a lot of people around for uh, what you've been doing over quite some years now. But uh, for those who don't know you, I wouldn't mind you sort of starting with a, a, a bit of a, a brief indu- introduction of what you do differently, Daniel, and more importantly, why do you do what you do? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go from the very start. Uh, basically, I was an auto electrician for years, oh, sorry, five years that I did that, um, apprentice auto electrician. Then I changed over to be a train driver. And then from there, obviously starting my own business, which is around 2016, 2017. And yep. the reason I, I ended up uh, falling into this business, and as you know, 2016, 2017 was before anyone was buyer's agents. Like I remember I remember having to call real estate agents in the first half an hour is explaining my job. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it was very different back then. But the reason I did it was because... I had been able to find my way out of a job as a tra- as a train driver and an auto electric- electrician, and I'd been able to find myself at a point where I was comfortable enough with the assets that I had to be able to transition into something I wanted to do rather than something I had to do. And I then wanted to show other people how I did it because I felt like there was such a burning desire to teach people the right way. But also at the time, and I mean, it still is to today, a lot of property spruikers, a lot of people out there that are just trying to grab somebody's money. And I wanted to expose them back then. So back then it was just me talking about like, hey, you know, that guy that wants to buy off the plan for you is probably not going to be the ideal candidate for you to build wealth. He's trying to build his wealth from you. (laughs) So I think I had a bit of a mission back then to, I guess, get people on the right path of investing and as you know, you know, since the, the early days of 2016, 17, and even earlier, uh, a lot more podcasts, a lot more information has come out. So people are getting more educated. And, and back then it was, you know, left up to the spruikers to educate. So I think it's, it's changed uh, since then. Yeah, I, I, you make a very good point because it's almost gone from a drought to a deluge in relation to information yeah. now. And there's almost too much information for people to go what the hell does that actually mean and how do I make any sense out of it? So, yeah, I'd love you sharing that. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind that going into a bit deeper into terms of your own journey by getting you to give us a bit of a reader's digest, if you like, of where you have invested your time, energy and money over the years and, and go back as, as early as you'd like to because often our formative years with our family are very instructive in that regard. So you can sort of take us back through that and then... and. Talk about where you've invested your time, energy, money during that period and how has it led you to where you are and what you're doing now? 
Yeah, so I mean, I started off obviously. Yeah, I left school around just I was just about to turn sixteen. Uh, I wanted to go out in the workforce. For me, I I always thought to myself, I'm never going to be the lawyer, the doctor. I'm never going to earn the massive money. You know, I'm a tradie. I'm, this is what I'm going to do. So I always was like, I want to transition from school into work as soon as I possibly could. And then I was like, and then I'm going to need as many assets as I possibly can. And I want to do it so early that, you know, by the time that I got to my 40s, the compounding effect had happened. So I, I left school at 16. I started working for my dad, who was an auto electrical, um, and I was an auto electrical apprentice at that point. So I started working for my dad. You d- uh, just a, I just want to jump straight in there because what I'm hearing already, before you'd even left school, you've got the concept of own, owning assets and, and uh, being in a position where you don't have to work in 40. Now, most people don't. They're thinking about girls, cars, and parties at that yes. stage of the game. So where did that... Uh, thinking come from that allowed you at a very early age to go, hey, I I know where I'm heading with this. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. I mean, I spent most of my childhood uh, flipping properties with my parents. So my parents were into, you know, anything they could do to make money. And I remember my dad saying to me, uh, you know, we've ran a business for, I think at that stage, what, 30, 25 years, something like that. And, you know, we've made more money out of property than business. And that's why we focus on it. So I spent a lot of my weekends looking at properties, going around, dad thinking about how we could change the, the, the layout or how he could do something to renovate it. And we used to renovate them ourselves. So, you know, my childhood was already ingrained into that, which, you know, as we talk about, like, it's like a program. My, my parents were silently programming me for what I was about to become. Uh, so they were doing that and I was helping them renovate and probably getting more in the way at that point. <laughs> um, but I was there to, to help. And then, uh, yeah, for, for me, I just wanted to, to go down that path by the age of about 15, 16, uh, you probably you would have known there was a couple of shows back then on Sky Business Channel. Yeah. Um, and I watched them religiously. And I remember sitting there at about, you know, I was 15 years old, still at school, and I would watch them at night. And I used to sit there thinking, I have no idea what they're talking about. Like, I, I'm just, but I'm going to watch it until I understand exactly what they're thinking and what they're saying and how they're doing it. Because these guys that were in the, in it, you know, building wealth themselves, they were already, you know, in their f- mid 40s to 50s. They had already done it and I was super impressed on where they were in life and how they had done it. And I thought to myself, why, like, I need to get into this as early as possible. And I mean, from a young age, I always wanted to, to be successful. Um, I had always had that desire and I think it comes back from uh, where you grew up and how you grew up, right? I grew up with not very much and my parents through property had been able to create a fairly decent middle class uh, sort of lifestyle. And, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, we're in Southwest Sydney still, so it wasn't like anything glamorous, right? But it was a decent lifestyle that I got to have growing up. But when we started out, it was like, you know, you're renting. It was the same thing. My mum and dad grinding it out in business, grinding it out and trying to make a dollar. And I felt that pain. My parents were very open with with my my um, myself and my sister about just how tough it was. Right, you know, you know, back in business, you can't afford to to draw wages. You know, two thousand and eight happened and everything like that, and they'd almost lost everything. So I guess it's you know most people don't see it because their parents don't talk about money. My parents would always share the good things and the bad things. So they were always prepared to say, look, we won on that property, we made $40,000, but they're also willing to share that they lost some money, or they're also willing to share that, you know, business wasn't doing well at that point. Um, so it allowed me to see everything, essentially. That's brilliant. I, I mean, they were way ahead of the, the times uh, in doing that, or, or, or very rare in yeah. that context, because, uh, you know, I, I picked up by osmosis really from my parents because they were active the dad was an active investor as well and i just sort of he was my role model so i always followed him uh but it wasn't we didn't get down to the nitty gritties if you like uh, because it was the old we were country folk and dad made the money and mum stayed in the kitchen yeah that's, that's pretty much how it rolled uh so i, I love that and, I, and I, I i love your sharing the you know watching the the sky uh news shows because what you were effectively doing was learning a new language you know i often say that if you're going to be good at everything anything you need to learn the language and understand that the concepts 
Uh, you don't expect to be brilliant overnight and just jump in and, and be a, a, an instant success. Learn the language, take the time, in, involve and invest in your knowledge as well as whatever you're investing in and you, you're going to be better off with that. So I yeah, love, love you, sh- you sharing that. If, if we look look back on then, uh, then I, and, you know, I picked up a bit of this uh, in the book, uh, Daniel. Um, can you talk to us about a, a challenging event in your life you think has brought about your greatest learnings and best changes as a, as a consequence of your journey so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people these days talk about YOLO and, you know, you don't need money to be happy and all that sort of stuff. And, and I think it comes from the events that you've had to be able to draw on the experience of, uh, you know, for me, I had my, my mum very early. She, she had breast cancer. Um, and we almost lost everything over that, right? And it was the thing that saved us was my dad had uh, a property to sell to come up with the money to be able to fund because the funding for the chemotherapy and the radiation and the surgeries and all the time off, uh, you're in business, no one's paying you, <laughs> uh, right? So my mum worked in the business with my dad. Yeah. Um, so we had to, we went through a few years of survival. It was like, it wasn't about making money at that point. It was about how much money do we have to survive. And and that hit home with me because I was starting my career at that point. I was working with my dad and I was an apprentice. And I remember my dad just like walking away from the business and I'm just, I'm second year in and I'm thinking, what do I do? You know, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I remember my dad saying to me like, you know, uh, you, 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 we, want, we want to make sure your mum survives this. I'm willing to shut the business down and walk away. Yeah. But, you know, it's up to you if you want to make it work. You can come in still and, and open the business up. I'll still try to help you as much as I can. Yeah. But I'm not I'm not in it anymore. This is about survival now. So I remember opening up the business and starting and it was the most challenging time both sides, right? Emotionally and I'm also freaking out that I'm opening up the doors to to bring business in to try and survive. And I'm thinking the way I'm helping my parents at that point is I'm trying to bring some sort of revenue in. I'm trying to bring something in to ease a financial burden because they can't work anymore. And not only can they not work, they're now pouring out money for all of this stuff. And I think when you go through something traumatic, you never forget it. And that became my why. It was like, money is so important, right? People don't think about money being important. Well, you haven't had a loved one where money solves a problem, yeah. right? And sometimes, and it's and it's the thing is, it's not about the money it's the problem that it solved at that point for me so i really attached my why going forward to i never want to be in that situation again i don't want to be that person that goes oh geez something's happened in my family as i get older and now all of a sudden we don't have the money to be able to save that person uh thankfully my mum survived and she she's free of cancer so but that happened you know back when i was about 18 so it was i was quite young um, and I think that you draw on those as your why for the long term. So for me, I worked incredibly hard for the next decade to make sure that that would never happen throughout my entire family. I wanted every generation in my family to be taken care of, essentially. You know, love it. And I, I, I mean, you're right. Uh, in in our Western world, uh, money is the is the currency of choice. Yeah. You know, because you don't have it, you don't have a choice. And and thank heavens. Uh, that your family were heavily invested in property because they had a war chest then that could cover their costs in the event that their income dried up uh, when your mum had her issues. So th- th- they were in a much better position than the, than most families in the country as a result of that, but, but a very formative time for you to take that on board. And I can, I can see why that's sort of driven the driven the why as far it's as... It's driven me to, yeah, till today. <laughs> it's, driven me, it's driven me very far. And I, and I mean, I've always been a person that takes a responsibility, I think because of those days back then, I've always taken the responsibility to protect the family around me and, and to protect, okay, if something goes wrong, if I have the knowledge, I can be the person that fixes it. And I think that 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 to, to me was powerful, right? It was like, if I can seek this knowledge, so at a very young age, I was always like, knowledge is power. You solve problems with knowledge, right? And if not, you live in fear. You live in fear because you don't have the, you don't have the knowledge to be able to uh, make sure that the fears disappear. So for me, it was always, if I have all the knowledge, then I have no excuses. I have to just work hard and I know that I need to do X, Y, and Z. But if I work hard, have knowledge, there's no excuses why I can't have what I want. 
Yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, perfectly said. Now, uh, sort of moving forward then, I, I know, again, from reading the book, you, you went from the uh, the apprenticeship exercise, became a train driver before you then uh, established the, the buyer's agency piece. And, and in parallel with that, it's, I often talk about the parallels between your passive life and your professional life in terms of what you're building uh, on that score. Can you sort of d- take us through that a little bit in terms of why train driver, what did that allowed you to do? How did that in, uh, uh, influence and uh, help your investment piece? And, and why did you then uh, ultimately... Uh, make the choice to make the change and do what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, I obviously wanted a trade background, so I didn't even want to be an auto electrician. <laughs> I actually wanted to be an electrician, household electrician. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I didn't have a license to be able to get anywhere, so I had jobs lined up. But my, you know, my dad said, "There's no way I'm helping you out driving around and doing anything. I've got my own life to run." So. Um, dad sort of said to me, "There's two ways about it. You, you're either going to go to go to go to." Um, school again and finish year 12 or you're going to come work for me so so for me i, I just went and worked for, for my dad um and yeah i did my four to five years and it didn't earn the money that i wanted it to earn you know you start off very low like any apprentice doesn't matter whether you started when i started or today you're starting off at very low wages i was on 254 dollars a week and i remember thinking to myself my mate was a concreter i was earning like triple that money and i'm like god i just want to why can't I like earn that money? I used to be upset with my dad about it. I'm like, we are, I earn such crap money. And my dad used to say to me, yeah, the difference is this. He started off on good money. So he will never know how to save well. He will never know how hard it was. And he said, you started off on bad money. So what will happen is you will think about how that little bit of money you have and how far it's going to go in life so that when you do earn bigger money, you know how to control it. And I know now <laughs> that that's the case. But back then, you're just thinking to yourself, this is, you know, I'm working the same amount of hours, getting this, getting less for it. I became a tradesman. I, I got my certificate and I had a, a, my dad's friend who got into the trains and, you know, he was just telling me how good it was. And if you work really hard, you can earn good money and everything like that. And I, at that stage, had already bought a, a, a property and I was onto my second property and I was thinking to myself, okay, I need to get to a third one, but I was stuck right? Like most people, right? As you build, you're always going to get stuck. I was stuck at that point and I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I can't keep pushing the auto electrical. It's going to take me a lot longer to get to where I where I need to be. The yeah. train driving job at that point was paying me the same money as me as a tradesman, right? So I was like, well, okay, I understand it's the same money, but I'm only starting this career. I could grow. So I I changed over. I got that job. Luckily, it was, it's a very hard job to get. I was, I think there was 10,000 or so applicants and there's like eight of us that got it. Like it was quite a, I almost pretty much was a miracle that I got it because I know my my boss told me, he's like, to be honest, we only take like 50 of the top resumes that are within the area. And then then we start to sort of cull them down from there. But he said, most of them I don't even look at. Um, so I think I was quite lucky in that respect. But it was an industry for me to say, if I work hard, I can continue to progress. Yep. If I do the hours, I can progress. Yep. And one thing that it set me up to do, which I didn't realize um, you know, at the time, was driving trains is quite a boring exercise. Uh, you go from A to B and you spend 12 hours on a train and there's not much to do. Yep. So I was, I was known on the trains as the guy like that just would be headphones in and just you know, learning. Don't talk to me for 12 hours, you know, and <laughs> everyone used to, everyone used to be like, oh yeah, if you get with him, he won't talk to you for like at least eight hours. He might talk to you when he's having his lunch. <laughs> uh, and people used to say, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm, and I used to tell people, I was very upfront with them. I'm here for 10 years and I'm out. I'm, I'm not going to go past 10 years. I'm here to make my money. I'm here to get out. And again, it was okay money. It wasn't like fantastic money. Like I think the the peak of my career, I was on 119,000. And that's me working every single night. Now, that was me doing, you know, I was, we used to do shifts and it was 12 hours on, seven hours off, 12 hours on. I used to do that back to back three times in a row. Yeah. Um, so it was long hours to make the money. Yeah. Um, but because I had the free time while I was on there, I used to just put it to work in education. And I was very um, aware early on that my education was the only thing that would ever separate me to be able to understand how to build wealth. And that no, even if an opportunity hits you in the face, if you don't have the education, it goes straight by you because yeah. you don't have the education to see that it was an opportunity. 
And um, so I was always like, the, the more I learn, the more I know, the more I won't miss an opportunity going forward. That's sort of I love it. Out- I love it. Like, hey, well, w- one thing I'm picking up really clearly is that there's a very strong uh, focus of attention with you. you. You've got very clear goals uh, and, and very focused and then don't allow anything you know, to get in the way of that. Is that something that's just inherent in you or is that something that has been nurtured through the family? Talk to us because it, it, it's something I think yeah, all good investors, uh, it's, a, it's a trait they all have. Uh, is that something natural or something that you've you've honed uh, with skill over time? Uh, it's, it's funny because it's in my family that everyone says Daniel gets obsessed and that's it. Uh, once I get obsessed with something, I will spend my entire day night whatever it is to be the best at it um you know i've done it in sports i've done it in everything that i've ever done i i was growing up was uh you know some people would say more adhd never stop i wouldn't sit down and watch tv i was always doing something and i felt guilty if i wasn't doing something so for me it was very controlled adhd into something if i had something that i knew i wanted I could really hone it. If I didn't have that, I'm a mess. I'm all over the place. I've got 30 things running, right? So it was, I think the the biggest thing was being able to control the energy and saying, stop looking at 10 things, start looking at one. And I think the biggest thing is with most people is they're trying to get rich quick. It's crypto, it's stocks, it's dividends, it's flipping real estate, it's long-term in real estate, it's commercial, it's residential. There's so much noise in the the marketplace now and everything's directed to quick. You can do it quick. This is how you do it to make money now. And I always subscribe to building wealth has to be something that's repeatable. It has to be something I can do long term. It has to be something I understand. And I want to make sure that when I do something that I identify as that person, because I wanted to become wealthy, I have to embody the identity of a wealthy person from a background of a middle class person very difficult to do right um and i used to envy the 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 rich you know i used to envy not rich wealthy i used to envy the wealthy right and i would see them we used to live southwest sydney and we would come once a year over to like you know your northern beaches eastern suburbs that type of thing we would put our little tinny in and we'd go looking across and go fishing and we'd see the waterfront properties and i used to envy those people thinking like what do they do how do they do it and I used to envy the children of them. I used to think that they're, not even if their their parents gave them anything, but the knowledge that they had, the confidence that they had that they could be successful was crazy, right? That opportunity they had. And I was that person where I was like, I don't have the opportunity. I have no one surrounding me with this with money. You know, the best it got was, you know, you got a brand new, you know, SS Commodore. That was like, that was like, geez, that's the rich guy over here. Um, so I was always envious of that. Yeah. And that was probably why I got so obsessed with how do I get out of where I am? How do I get my family out of where I am? And how do we get to the location we want to live? How do we get to our dream life? And um, I, asked, I, I spent 15 years doing it. Love it. I, I, I love that focus uh, and, and, the, and the drive that's necessary to do it because uh, it, it, despite what instant might try and uh, communicate uh, success comes with with a lot of dedication and hard work there's, there's no question about it. there's no getting around that and not yeah. to be sustainable anyway and, and that again that that long-term approach that you spoke about that's that's also a rarity you know, it's something that i also ascribe to and i often often say that good uh, investors whether it be property or whatever are actually have addictive personalities because yeah. uh, they want to know the inside and out of it but rather than turn to alcohol and drugs we turn to property and other things to to churn our uh, activity into, and then then hone that skill and knowledge to actually benefit from it. But that that long term approach again is that something you infuse from family, or is that something you picked up from your education, your learnings? Because uh, not not many people uh, see the merits in that that long term sustainable approach. Yeah, I think I picked that up from uh, a couple of mentors that I would say were mentors at the time that were more. Uh, they didn't know me. I knew them very well, but they were on Sky Business Channel, and I remember. You know them talking about it you know the success is not going to come in a minute it's going to take a decade it's going to take two decades it's the saying you know overnight success took 20 years i think um 
I understood because I listened to older people. I was a young person listening to somebody that was in their mid forties to mid fifties, right? And when you do that, you get a lot of wisdom early and you start to realize that nothing's going to happen quickly. And uh, I always subscribe to that. You know, I knew that I wasn't going to be a millionaire in the first two, three years. I knew it was going to be tough. And, you know, I think that everyone that wants to become wealthy, rich is different. Rich is quick. Wealthy is long, right? That's just two different things. If you want to be rich, go get a great income. You can be rich. If you want to be wealthy, you have to transfer that great income into wealth. And that takes many, many years. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It's going to take many, many years. And that's why they talk about when they talk about wealth, they talk about generational wealth. They don't say generational rich. Because <laughs> generational rich is not long lasting. It's a, it's active, yeah. right? And I wanted to say, how do I change? How do I change active into passive? Well, that's going to take so long. And I understood very early, I'm only going to live off five or 6% of my entire net worth. Yeah. So therefore I need to have a lot of net worth to be able to do that. How do I do it? Well, many years. <laughs> love it. Absolutely love that, mate. That absolute gold uh, that you've said right off the bat there. Well, that, that's a great segue then, I think, into just laying that out for us. And I I, I, I don't want to dive too deep into the six principles because I know that they pretty much... Uh, support and are the foundation for everything you've done. But talk to us a bit about your investment journey then uh, to build that portfolio. And I know it's, it's not just about property, there's, there's crypto and other bits and pieces in the mix. Can you can you talk us through what you did, why, what you learned from it? And also uh, at the end of that, what was your investment strategy when you started and how has it changed and evolved as your knowledge, comfort and clarity has increased over time? Because that, that's a, another thing that a lot of people don't quite get their head around. Um, yeah. So in terms of, uh, sorry, go through, can you just go through Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a big lot. question. Yeah, yeah. So just, just take I us wanna, through. I just want to answer it well. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and you will. Uh, take us through the investment journey uh, per yep. se. And, and I'm, I'm interested in how you did it rather than the nitty gritties of what you did, uh, yeah. but I so let, let's start there, and then I want to look at the what worked well, what didn't work, and what were the learnings from from that. So uh, take us on that journey. Yeah, I mean how how I did it um, in terms of investing was I pretty much understood very early that I needed to leverage one property to the next. So equity was one thing, and then I understood that I needed income, which was another thing. So I think to me, I wanted to boil it down to be very simple. Uh, income gets transferred to property. And when I get equity, I release the equity and I go buy more property. And I wanted to just keep it very simple. And my methodology when I started was uh, if I buy one property, everyone used to tell me it will take you 30 years to pay off a property. So if I buy the first property, I'll then go buy the second property next door. And then you told me they're going to double every 10 to 15 years. So when it doubles, I'll sell one property, pay the other one off. I never had to do anything. And I was able to pay off that property uh, without me working hard. So that sort of was why and and how I was starting the thesis. And then I was like, well, if I could do that on two properties, well, now I just now to need to figure out how to do that on 10 or 15 or 20 properties. So I wanted to buy more properties than needed so that I could just continue to replicate it. So I think the biggest thing was I wanted to simplify how to build wealth and I wanted to simplify the theory on how to do it. And then I would put it into action and be very practical about it. And I just kept running with the same theory. Um, and it, what it allowed me to do is also take the risk out of it because I would say to myself, well, if I buy 10 properties and five of them double and the other five just didn't grow, I could sell five, pay off the other five. And essentially I, I had a 50% strike rate on being right. And I still executed on the exact same strategy that I wanted to do. So I think you know, when you when you understand that, you start to say, oh, I can relax a little bit. I don't have to be 100% correct. I could be 80%, 70% correct, still execute on the exact same strategy, still get to my wealth building exercise. So I think the biggest thing was when I was building my wealth was understanding the thesis on how I was going to build wealth. Yeah. Um, I also was sort of hybriding meth. My hybrid method was from two different people back in the day. One was talking about equity. One was just like, I buy for equity, I buy for growth. Yeah, screw cash flow. I don't care about cash flow. And then the other one was like cash flow everything and 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 the ca and the capital growth will come. 
So there's your two different, and I think today it's still very much, they're your two different sort of methodologies of investing. So I hybrided them together and said, well, both are important. Yeah. Um, how do I get both of these? So I was thinking about, well, how am I going to retire as well off this? Well, my net worth is what I needed to be able to transfer into cash flow. Yeah. And I can't get cash flow without net worth. So therefore, cash flow was important to hold a property and hold my wealth and be able to maintain it. But my net worth was important to be able to transfer into cash flow later down the track. Double. So I was always thinking about that. Uh, how do I build my net worth? How do I build my net worth? I'm going to buy properties, make sure I'm happy with the yield. You know, And the thing is, when you, when you think of it that way, it doesn't matter whether interest rates go up, down, sideways. I'm thinking about it as how do I cash flow a business? Things may get good, things may get bad, they may get tougher, but I need to have the emergency funds in place. I need to have my strategy in place so that I do not get shaken when interest rates go higher or when interest rates, um, you know, if they go lower, I can obviously just capitalize on those things. So I was always very strict on my strategy the whole way through, which is what you talk about with concentration and what I was doing. Yeah, uh, Brian, and I, I guess... Yeah, you know, there'll be a lot of people out there listening to this, and and you're probably getting a lot of people asking you this question because I I know I have I have in recent times, and the people say, oh, "It's all right for you, Bushy," uh, you know, in your in your day, uh, it was easy uh, to get more equity and and to to have income to get more borrowings. But now, I you know, I'm capped out. I've got two or three properties, and I I that's it. I, I'm done. Well, yep. What do you say to them in terms of being able to jump that hurdle and and continue to build their portfolio if they need to? I would say every investor challenge has that same challenge. Every investor, regardless of when they invested, they all have the same challenge. Now, sometimes, yes, you may not have a favorite time to be investing compared to, say, 10 years ago or five years ago or now. Landscape economically is going to change. Um, you just have to deal with it, right? What are you going to do? Complain? Like, who's going to listen and who's going to fix your problems? At the end of the day, you fix your own problems, right? So you can either complain and you can either say it's just it was tougher it's tougher now than it was back then but at the end of the day no one cares right you're the only person that can fix the problem so i used to identify it right i used to say to myself every time okay i hit a serviceability wall i can't buy any more property what's my problem right okay i have an income problem okay cool now i know what to fix and that's time to go fix my income problem i remember my uh, i had my second mortgage broker very knowledgeable guy he was a good mentor for me, you know, and I think everyone has a mentor that they can outgrow and eventually change. Yeah. But what I had was I had a, a mentor uh, that said to me, Daniel, just be happy you got four properties now. You've done really well in life, right? I said, yeah, I, I don't want to know about that. What I want to know about is what problem do I have? And he would say, well, you can't buy any more property. You've got a serviceability issue. So, okay, so well, how much do I need to be able to overcome it? Oh, well, if you, he punches it into his serviceability calculator. Well, if you do X, Y, and Z, then you'll be able to get your next property. All right, give me 12 months. Yeah. And I would be back at it. And I would be like, how do I figure it out now? I think, yeah. you know, the biggest thing is you have a problem, either whinge about it or identify it and change the problem, right? So I had to change careers three times. Yeah. Um, I had to keep chasing. At one point, I drove freight trains and ran a business. I did both. Um, identify the problem and fix it because... I think that most people these days want to complain about something so that they can validate why they don't have to fix it. Right? I think that's a big thing, you know. So and I, true, mate. I see it a lot. I see it a lot. Yeah, people go, yeah. I see people go, oh, it's really it's just too hard to buy a property. Next minute you see them in Europe. Yeah. Well, of course it's hard to buy a property. I've never been to Europe. I've never been to America. Of course it's hard to buy a property if you're spending 30 grand on holidays and you're not, you have to be very laser focused. And I think what people don't think about is we are in a competitive capitalist society. Yeah. Right. It is that. And and I don't care if somebody thinks it's right or wrong. It just is. It is. And I think that people need to understand is everyone's competing. And when we talk about property, we talk about location, your desired place, where you want to live, what you want to do. You are competing against everyone else for that. Yeah. And I think that you have to, you know, go, well, it is what it is. Am I willing to compete? Am I willing to spend the years? Because if I spend 10 years grinding it out to get to where I need to be, Remember, there will be thousands of others doing the same, yeah, right? So I, th I just think that, yeah, I, uh, I don't know whether people are just getting a little bit weaker these days, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's definitely I, possible today. It's, it's totally possible. Yeah, It's totally possible. You, and, and I think the, the, the biggest challenge that uh, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably showing my age a bit now uh, to some degree, Daniel, but the creativity seems to have gone. I think people are so in tune with the with being entertained on every form of digital you can get your hands on. Their ability to use their own imagination dries up like a like a uh, uh, an old vine. And, I think uh, sacrifice too. I think people aren't willing to sacrifice these days. Like, I mean, if you go back and in my book, it, it talks about it. I lived in a, a, a garage, which was converted into a granny flat at the time. And I lived in there till I was 28 years old. I was, I actually had created my first million net worth at 25 and I was still living in a garage at 28. Yeah. And the reason for it was I knew that every year that I lived in that garage, I'd bring forward my retirement five years. Did I want to live in that garage? No, it was cold. <laughs> it was very cold, right? I didn't want to live there. It was dark. But, and I had a I had a house that I had built that was like three streets from me. It was a four bedroom home. Beautiful. I could have lived in that. Yeah. But the cost to live in that was a lot higher than it was to live in, uh, you know, someone's backyard. So I was all about delay gratification, right? And I think that people just need to work out what their priorities are in life. You know, the, the biggest thing that I realized was as much as people say life's too short, if you live a full life, life is very long. And I think that if you have, uh, you know, if you party, if you, and, and I think you can do everything to a degree, right? You can, you can still balance it. Of course. But if you go and party, blow it all in your twenties and you know, you're doing that because you're living with your parents or you're doing that because costs are really low, you don't have a family. Just remember, you won't get back that time and you will then have more responsibilities when you get into your thirties and forties. And then you will be wishing you took the opportunity in your twenties. And that's what I try to tell young people is what you earn now and what you save now, even though you might earn more money in 15 years time, you might be at the peak of your career. I guarantee you, you save less of it, right? Because it's a lot harder to save when you have a full family, you have mortgages, you have kids and everything going to schools. Yeah. That's when life gets harder. So I was, I think I, I knew that before it even happened, right? So I was like, I'm going to have a family in the future life's going to get tougher. And then when I get to my thirties, mid thirties, I have plenty of life left. So I wanted to, you know, make my, my time a lot easier when I had energy, right? I always talk about energy. Yeah. Your twenties, you have the most energy thirties. You have energy forties. You kind of start to get in the back end fifties. You have no energy. You want to retire, <laughs> right? You start to lack the energy levels. And I understood that. I'm enthusiastic. I have the will to do it. I have the most energy now. Why miss this opportunity? Because one day I won't have the energy and I don't want to be an Uber driver at 55. That's just how I, I saw it. Yeah. And, and just a, just a, a great way to, to think about it. And, and such a, sadly, a rarity uh, amongst the current generation for all the reasons we've spoken about. Uh, one thing before I, I, I change lanes a little bit, uh, I know you've, you've been, obviously invested in heavily in property. You've also uh, dipped into the, the crypto game. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the differences between the two because, I, you know, there's a, a lot of people who, who like to chase shiny new things uh, and, and crypto certainly early on uh, for doing that. It's, it's getting close to a critical mass now where it's been, been taken seriously across yeah. the board. But uh, if you look at those two asset classes uh, in, in, the, in the context of your overall strategy... Uh, where did property fit into that strategy and where did crypto fit into that strategy and what were the differences in the two in terms of the way you manage that investment? Yeah, so property for me is safety. Property for me is the hedge against inflation. It was uh, cash flow. It was how I would retire. Uh, crypto was the get rich, you know, in the next couple of years and I could see an opportunity in it and I delved a lot of uh, my time into informing myself whether it was a good decision to get into or not. But my ultimate mindset of crypto was transfer that money straight out and put it back into property every time because safety, that's safety, right? Yeah. Um, now, there's a, there's a camp that argues that Bitcoin's going to be the best thing since life spread and it's going to be, and it might be, it, it might be that, right? But at the end of the day, I'm not willing to risk what I've built for 15 years for it. So I did put a, a quite a lot of money into it. Um, I think it was roughly four or five hundred grand that I that I did put into it. Yeah. At one stage, I took it up to one point eight million within yeah. eleven months. Yeah. Um, and and it, it you know worked out to me for somewhat, but I also have lost money, big money in it as well. And I've won and I've lost. 
And I, I think that the big thing was the differences was uh, crypto was a year of crypto is like 25 years of investing mentality wise. Yeah. The stress. And I'm talking, and when I, would say, when I talk about that, I'm not talking about investing five grand. I'm talking about my portfolio could adjust to $200,000 in an hour. Yeah. Which, so when people see that, well, it went from 400 to 1.8. That's great. I remember having a holiday and um, and I was I was camping. I had my caravan and I I undid the hitch and it went into the back of my ute and it was a disaster. And my wife's like, "Oh, what's going on?" And I didn't tell her at the time, but I think I was down five hundred thousand at one point. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking to myself, I can't think on this holiday, yeah, because I am just lost half a million dollars on this trade that I was doing. So. It's like anything, when you have high volatility, you have high reward, Yeah, but you no need to risk. know what you're doing and you have high risk, you're right? So the, the property is low, low volatility, right? But you still have high reward because of the leverage. So the leverage is the key to high reward without the volatility. Yes. But when I was looking at crypto, crypto is, I would no way in any means leverage <laughs> crypto, but it is money that you're willing to lose yeah it's something that you're willing to make money on but you need to get out and i think this is what i truly think with crypto this is why my mentality was why i put you know four or five hundred grand into it if i'm going in i have to make big money yeah the reason for it is it's going to take the same mental exhaustion yeah. that and it's going to take my energy yeah or that i need to make such a big reward that if I don't, if I put a small amount of money in, like twenty grand, thirty grand, the reward isn't big enough for the energy output. What I find is a lot of people in the crypto space they put ten grand into it and then they think that's their lottery ticket. <laughs> well, it might go to a hundred grand, but it's still not going to solve your problems. It might go to two hundred grand, it's still not going to solve your problems. You're not going to retire. So what what I what I was doing was I was understanding that there was a time in the market to make big money. And then a time to try and get out of it. Unfortunately, I got out of that one, uh, one of those ones where it was two weeks before I had a 50% uh, capital gains discount. And I had to wait. I was right on the last week. I was going to pull it at 1.8 and I ended up taking out 600K, right? So that could have wildly changed where I was. Um, yeah. But that's just the game, right? Like that's the game you play. I still made money. I just didn't make as much money and it's not your money until it's in your pocket. And um, I think that with cryptocurrency, you do it once you've built wealth. That's how I look at it, it's, right? It's almost your gambling money. Either. It's okay, right? We've got the foundation that now can play a bit rather than- Yeah. Uh, well, as you, know, you say- on cash flow either, right? Like Exactly. It, yes, you can get, you know, I know people will say, yes, you can stake it. Um, but there's also a lot of coins that went to zero and there's a lot of people that put their money in that never got it back out, right? We're still in the early journey where the risk is so high to get your money back out. Yeah. I had Luna coin 200 grand went to zero in five minutes. Yeah. I couldn't even get it out quicker than I could see it go down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have to understand that when you throw money into something like that, and this is where, this is where you've got to be careful too, is why I don't advocate it too much is you're changing your mindset to think quick win. I'm exactly. going to be rich because I did this. Um, but it, again, what did I talk about at the start? It has to be repeatable if you want wealth. It yeah. has to be repeatable. I yeah. can't repeat that, right? No. Um, the circumstantial, not, not sustainable. Yes. It was a very, very different yep. exercise. And, and you, the whole mindset, the way you think, the way you act, your response times, everything is is completely different. So it's, uh, you know, I, used to trade, I trade CFDs, uh, which I'm, I'm, again, showing my age, but I, I, I leveraged into equities yep. uh, to, to upsize my yeah, position size. And, and I got fried on, on occasion. Just like I said, the, the stress... Obviously, yeah. was, and, you know, the, the mental, the the mental anguish for, for it's like minute by minute. It's, oh. it's different. It's just different. Now, if I put 10 grand in there today, I'll just walk away from it. I would never think about it. But when you're putting big money into it, you do have to think about it. I had a guy that used to drive freight trains with me, very, very smart guy. Uh, he retired at like 27, 28. And he was, I think, about 36, 37 when he came back to the trains. Now, he retired for that period of time, never yep. worked. Yep. Um, and I said to him, well, why, why are you back? You know, why, why are you here now? And he's like, well, I was doing really, really well. And then the financial crisis happened. Um, and I had leverage on the same thing. He had option trades. And oh, he yeah. said, uh, 
I lost it all. And he said, I was, he said, the funny thing was I had enough money to never have to work again. And he said, but because you think you are smarter than the market, you keep going because you, you've always been winning. So I'm going to keep going. So it's a form of gambling. It's an educated gamble. And he just kept going until he lost it all. And he said, the funny thing was I lost it in a matter of months. Yeah. And he said, because I thought I was better and I thought I was clever, like more clever than everyone else in the markets because I had been able to do it so well. And that was something that had always stuck with me that you were never more clever than everyone else, right? So when you go to, when I go to property, it's a foolproof way over time to sustain wealth. Yeah. But when I go into anything else, you are pretending that you're smarter than everyone else and you're just not. Yeah, I, I agree. I, there's a very fine line between ignorance and arrogance uh, and they're, they're closely linked when it comes to that exercise. Tell me, uh, before I jump into the future briefly, uh, Daniel, uh, what do you still struggle with, if anything? Um, I think, with the, I think uh, you know, I talk about playing a game. <laughs> Life is like playing a video game, I always talk about. Yeah. I think as you keep going forward, you will always struggle with your self-confidence because you're always trying to get to the next level that you haven't unlocked. Yeah. So you're always so so regardless of what somebody sees of me, they will say you have everything, you should be the most confident person in doing everything, right? Uh, building wealth, all of that. But when you are trying to get to the next level, yes, I could look back at all the levels I've achieved and I could say I could do all of them with confidence. But when I'm unlocking a new level, there's still self-doubt. It'll always be there because you can't unlock a new level that you've never been, you've never treaded on and then go, oh, I've got so much confidence because I've passed the previous 12 levels. So I think that was one thing that I still, I don't think struggle with, I recognize. And I think that the same thing with um, anxiety, I've struggled with anxiety and it's actually gotten worse in 15 years for me. I never even had it when I was younger. I never had it when I started investing and I've had more of it, but I'm also have to understand I'm doing 20 times more than I used to. So the anxiety comes from understanding that you, you know, for one, you want more for yourself. You want better out of yourself, right? So for me, when I have anxiety, I recognize that maybe I'm not doing the actions that my anxiety is filling up with, right? So I might be taking a weekend off and then I might have anxiety. It's because I have tasks to complete. That's why I have anxiety. I just recognize that I have it and where it is. And I think that everyone has it to a degree. Yeah. It's just when it flares up and why. And I think if you want to get, let's, you know, when you, when you go to, when you go up into, you know, becoming more and more successful, it's like a pyramid, right? You yep. build a foundation and then you keep building upon it. But the problem is the, the higher you get in that pyramid, the, the steeper it gets and the more to the tip that you will become. Yeah. Right. And what happens is that point is you can fall off the tip so much easier than you could down at the foundation level. Yeah, right. I make a mistake 10 years ago and I lose a thousand dollars. I make a mistake now. Like I'm, this is just an example. I'm negotiating personally on a $15 million building at the moment. Yeah. I make a mistake. It's millions. Yeah. Right. That, that in itself has a level of complexity that takes some of my mental anguish and awesome. some of my anxiety to a new level because it's something I've never done. And also, even if I have done it, it doesn't matter because the stakes are higher. And it is, and that's what happens. Yeah, and I beautifully said it's that life is never free from uh, worry. Yeah, the worry that you have done have an up, or when you when you've got a lot, you're worried. How am I going to hold on to it? It's it, it never goes away; it just changes shape. And we always we always find stress. Um, there's stress. As human humans are always wanting to ha well, not wanting that always have stress in some capacity, right? So, for example, as I am building up, I might have stress of financial pressure. Once I have financial uh, stability, I'll have stress on being able to maintain that financial stability. Once I'm retired, I then have stress that the postman delivered twice that day and not once, right? Like you find stress even, and what happens is when you have no stress, you find the smallest amount of things to stress about. So you just have to understand that you're always going to have it in some capacity and that how do you manage it and identify it? Why is it happening? And then how do you keep moving forward beyond it? Yeah, love it. Uh, I want to jump into the future now. I'm a big advocate of living by design, not by default. Uh, so can you paint us a bit of a, a word picture 
of, of what your ideal life vision is for you and your wife, uh, and then uh, what's your ongoing strategy to both attain and then maintain that? Yeah, I mean, my ideal life, I think, in the last 12 months has probably occurred now. Um, yeah. I moved from the southwest Sydney, which is where I grew up, and I finally moved from there. I now live in the northern beaches on the water, have my boat out the front, 50-foot yacht, got the Lamborghini, got everything. So from an outside perspective, it's there. Um, doesn't mean it's fulfilling, but it's there. Yeah. I think that the life by design now is I have what I have. It has to be sustainable forever. Yeah. And the sustainability means that if I was to die tomorrow, does my family sustain the same life? I think that is now my driving force and, and it's it's there, but how far do you want to push? And I think that um, once you get to a certain level, you get to a point of financial freedom and anything above that, it unlocks more luxuries, probably not more fulfillment, but it does unlock more luxuries. But the incremental happiness is very small, right? Yes. So yes. I live in a six million dollar house here, right? The house across the road from me is worth twenty million. Yeah. And I've had people say, Well, you're gonna try and get to that next. Yeah. Not really. No. Why why? Yeah. why I live on the same street, I have the same views, I have the same boat. Why would I why would I want to stress for the twenty now if it comes naturally, I'll obviously take yeah. it because it doesn't have the stress and I've got the financial freedom. But I will not trade financial freedom for a $20 million house. Why no. would I do that? I've got no. financial freedom in a $6 million house. I don't have it over there. Yeah. So I think what happens is as you build up through your life, you understand eventually what makes you happy, what makes you fulfilled, and what yeah. true financial freedom looks for you. Yeah. Um, and let, let's let's dive straight onto that. What What is fulfillment? to you I'd, I'd love your definition fulfillment is something that is if if you don't get paid for it would you still do it i think yeah. that's that's fulfillment for me yeah um fulfillment for me is doing this right i yeah. like i like sharing my experiences i like sharing my knowledge um i do it for free on instagram social media and i do it in podcasts i do that for free and i think you know it's the same with the book I had two years to write a book there's no the, the, the fulfillment's there there's no monetary value behind yeah. it but it's fulfillment so I think um, now my fulfillment is in the form of legacy now. So it's in the form of if I disappear tomorrow, is there enough content out there for people to understand and listen to yep. so that they can gain an edge for their family and create generational wealth? The fulfillment is for somebody to come up to you and say, Daniel, you changed my life. Like that's fulfillment. Yep. Um, and that's not to do with money. And we might not have ever met that person, um, I love it. but I think I love that's fulfillment. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, that's, it's really interesting. I, we, we're on parallel journeys, probably a different uh, age time frame because uh, I, I had a, a early life crisis which, which ground zero at everything and I had to start again and, and, and got very focused at that point. But my own definition of fulfillment, similar to yours, is giving freely to others without ever expecting anything in return and hopefully then not even knowing I'm doing it. Because yeah. there's just a sense of satisfaction that comes out of that. You, you can't... It's hard to describe, but you can't put a dollar value on it. On it, but yeah. the the, the uh, peace and serenity and and the sense of satisfaction that comes out of it is yeah, it's 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 worth its weight in gold. It, when you give someone something that they don't that they don't have to give you something back in return, that's when you feel that fulfillment. I think when I say to someone, "I'm going to teach you something," and I'm not asking for anything, then you feel that fulfillment because you're not expecting a return. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said. If we uh, circle back then, and you were starting out uh, again then, Daniel, uh, what, if anything, would you invest in differently? Um, I invested heavily into my education when I was younger. Mm. I probably would have went even deeper with it. I think that, I mean, when I say heavy, it was like heavy for the time, <laughs> right? Like when I look back now, though, I, I think to myself, if I'm going to have a journey and the journey has a lot of landmines on it, but the mentor that I had in place could tell me where they all were, yep. I would have been able to succeed a lot quicker. So, you know, this is just an example. I I pulled out of um, probably three properties in Sydney back in 2013, 12, 2012 for about 300, 350,000 that are all over a million dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of opportunity I lost because I was focusing more on the cost of mentorship. Yep. that I did not see 
the opportunity cost of not knowing the information. Yes. Um, and I think that the only separator in life between what where you are and what you want is knowledge, right? Because if you have the knowledge, then it's laziness if you don't have it, right? It's yes. just you don't want to do it, right? Like, And that's okay. Not everyone wants to be successful and not everyone wants to create heaps of money um, or, or, you know, do that. And, and I just think for me, it was just more so understanding that it's impossible to lose if you have the knowledge. Yeah, it, absolutely. And and if you do lose it, you can do it again. That, that's yes. what once yeah. it's in build, it's it's uh it's it's with take it away from me, I'll do it. It's it's funny because if you look at anyone that makes millions of dollars, creates wealth and then loses it all, they get it back the second time twice as quick. Yes. They do it a third time, it's three times as quick. Yeah. Now the person that sees that hasn't done it says, Oh, that's risky. Look, he went bankrupt, but look how quick he came back. Exactly. It's knowledge that did it. Totally. That's the only difference. I love it. Talking about knowledge, where I'm now going to give you a blindfold and cigarette and jump straight into what I call the ambush round, uh, where I that you see old podcast fast for that people love to get your words of wisdom on. Uh, to, to kick that off, uh, what couple of books have changed your life the most? I mean, it, I think like anything, right? The perception of money, which would be Rich Dad Poor Dad, that's probably like a foundation. Um, business would be a, bit, a book called Traction. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, but in saying that, though, I don't think, I mean, I like books. I mean, I've got a book out, but I don't think that you need to read heaps of books to be able to get the information you need. You just need to read a, a few, and it's what area you don't want to read them in. I think that, which is why I didn't create a property book per se, I created a book around building wealth, yeah. is because you've got to be careful that you're not results driven. You've got to, be, you've got to understand the journey of it. And I think that's that's the books that you want, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautifully said. Uh, uh, if you could have a coffee with anyone, either alive or dead or an historical figure, who would you choose and why? I'd probably go with someone current. And the reason for it is they they are, you, they've experienced what's, what's happening today, right? And they're adapting. And I think our world is changing so much that you need to be adaptive. I would probably pick someone like Hormozzi because he is business orientated, very smart guy. And he is seeking from so many mentors that the knowledge he has is so great because he's been able to regurgitate information from probably a hundred mentors compared to somebody that just has their material. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, what superpower do you wish you had and why? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've never really thought about it. probably to be immortal, I think, to be able to see how things happen, right? Like, uh, why wouldn't you? I think that we all strive to live longer. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want to live forever and see multiple generations of your family loins and be able to uh, continue, like for me, it'd be like continue to educate and see where life could take, you know, it could take you, your kids, your grandchildren. Yeah, I love that. Uh, last one then, uh, again on books, what would be the title of the book about you if I asked your wife or your parents? I think what I what it is <laughs> six principles to try younger and richer. I think that's what it would be, right? Like, um, love it. Love yeah, it. I don't think it would change. <laughs> yeah, now that's good. That, that's good to hear. Uh, last question then uh, before we close off on uh, part one of our great conversation. What's what's the one question that I, that you wish I'd asked you, and how would you advance it? Probably more about why do, why does property go up in value? Okay, okay I think, answer that. I think understanding. Because that's, that's the difference, right? Understanding why it happens. And I think that then comes back to more economical side of things, like looking at economics, looking at, you know, I, I very much delve into economics and that sort of side of things. So understanding that because you're in a vehicle of property, but why are you in the vehicle? Yes. I think that's a very, that's that's something that most people don't ask themselves. They just like property goes up in value, but but why? Why? Is it going up in value, right? And then when it doesn't go up in value, why is it going up in value? Understanding that, that comes back to economics. And for me, I understood very early that, uh, I mean, I was even, you know, saying it five years ago on videos, why the middle class will get wiped out. And I'm a very big advocate of why the middle class will get wiped out. Yeah. And it's because we are all swimming upstream while the printing presses keep happening yeah. and we keep getting devalued and it's becoming a little bit more well-known now, but it was something that was not well-known. And I knew this 15 years ago. I was like, every time they keep printing money, they keep devaluing our middle class, they keep ruining what we have in terms of a good life. And it means that 
if we're in a river, the more they print money, the harder it is to swim up the, uh, up the river. Yep. And the wealthy person understands, I'm not going to swim up the river. I'm going to get a life raft with a motor behind it. Right, I'm going to get. I'm going to use. And what the motor is? The motor is they're going to use the property and the debt, yeah. and they're going to buy those properties with debt. Because if you want to build wealth, you would. Sorry, if you want to maintain wealth, you will acquire prop. You acquire properties, right? But if you yeah. want to build wealth, you use leverage to acquire properties. That's building wealth. That's yeah. two different things. That but works. what you're doing is. You're recognizing that you're shorting the dollar long term and you're longing the property, the asset. Scarcity goes up in value over time because the, the, the currency lost value. And the currency is losing more value than ever before and people are starting to see it. They couldn't see it before. The silent tax that we had, 2%, 3%, they strive for us to lose money. They straddle it. And I think that uh, that is something that has been a big drive force for me to make people wake up. Debt is good. Debt devalues. Debt is what makes you generational wealth. Um, you know, go look at all of these billionaires, right? What do they do? They don't create income taxes for themselves. They they go leverage against their assets to go buy more assets in the form of debt because they don't have to pay taxes. How do you get out of paying taxes, right? If I go, uh, for example, I'm trying to acquire a fifteen million dollar building right now. Mm. If I need a uh, three point seven million dollar loan, uh, sorry, not loan deposit against that $15 million yep. building, $4 million. So yep. if I have to come up with $4 million, if I want to come up with that in income, I need $8 million Yeah. Because I need to pay yeah. the taxes and everything exactly. along the way. So I need $8 million to come up with $4 million. If I need to leverage it from property, I just need $4 million. Exactly. Now I work out how to cash flow it, right? So I think that's, that's such a superpower, which is what I talk about phantom equity in the book. That's such a superpower because- if the person that is working hard loses like 40 to 50% of everything that they ever earn and I can acquire, yes, I still lose my money through my income, but it's not my focus. If I trade it over to this side and I'm buying and acquiring assets, now I can leverage tax-free money and it means that I can build 10 times as quick because I'm compounding that every single time exactly. I do it. The double whammy exercise. I'd, I love that. Look, uh, we're going to get into more of that in uh, next week's episode when we dive into the book. So uh, I really want to thank you for taking the time to share the ins and outs of your journey so far, Daniel. And uh, while we're about it, if anyone would like to keep the conversation going and get your questions answered by other like-minded investors and independent property professionals in a very safe, relaxed and education-only environment, feel free to join us on the Property Hub Collective Facebook community by clicking the link in the show notes and we look forward to connecting more with you there. Alternatively, if you're needing a more private and confidential personal solution session to help overcome any of your challenges, feel free to uh, catch up with me personally for an hour by hitting the book appointment button on the top of the knowhowproperty.com.au homepage or the link in the show notes. And we now look forward to continuing our deep dive discussion next week, Daniel, uh, where we're going to unpack your great new book, Six Principles to Retire Younger and Richer. So uh, thanks again. Remember to always get invested and we look forward to chatting with you more then. Thanks, mate. Stay Thanks tuned for, for part two of this interview next episode. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design. By getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration, along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red-hot property investing news and insights, direct from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge, and I look forward to seeing you next time.